My name is Mark Seeger. I'm, I'm pretty new to Suze. I just joined a couple of months, a couple of months ago. I came over with the, uh, with the HPE cloud acquisition. Um, prior, to, prior to my cloud work, I'd spent about a dozen years working in high-performance computing. And in the world of high-performance computing back then, um, we were still Digital Equipment Corporation, and we built this thing called the Alpha Processor, and we had built some very, very large compute clusters, which were typically in several in the top 10 in the, uh, in the, uh, high, in the uh, supercomputing 500 list, if anybody's familiar with it. So we built a lot of big systems, and we had this data collection tool on, on Unix called Collect. And right, or, right around within the next year or two, we st it, we, it became clear everybody was moving to Linux, and we were trying to figure out what kind of data collection tools we had on Linux. And it was like, geez, it'd be nice if we had Collect for Linux. And if you kind of say Collect for Linux real quick, you wind up with Collectal. So that's where this all came from. It originated from the high-performance computing arena. So what I basically wanted to talk about was, first of all, do we really need another monitoring tool? We got a zillion monitoring tools out there already. Why do we need one more? So I want to talk a little bit about that. I like to talk a little bit about some of the basics about how Collecta works. And then there's a couple utilities that I wrote that kind of, high, that kind of um, enhance the data that Collecta collects called call plot and call mux. And then afterwards, something that I find real useful is, hey, this is all interesting, but what the hell do I do with it? You know, how's it gonna, how am I gonna apply this to my daily job? And hopefully I can give you a few examples that might get you there. Hmm. What happened? There we go. So one of the first questions a lot of people ask is, you know, well, why do I need system monitoring data? And I believe there's a lot of different reasons and different people might have different needs. Some people want to know what is my system doing right now? And when that happens on a Linux system, you usually run something like top or, you know, NP stat or VM stat or one of these things. Sometimes you want to know what happened on my system yesterday, and now you can't run these because they're not logging data to a file. They're not logging data anywhere. So if you happen to remember to set up something like SAR, as an example, it'll collect the data for you, and then you can go back and play it back. Um, sometimes you want to know what happened. You know, my system crashed. Why did it crash? And you may need different kinds of data for that. Um, there's also times where you want to use some of the data for system tuning. Sometimes you want to do benchmarking, and sometimes you actually want to troubleshoot an application. And the point is, there's a lot of different tools people use for different reasons, depending on what problem is they're trying to solve. And again, I ask the question, do we really need another tool? And there's a, the problem is there's a lot of tools to choose from. You know, I, I, I already mentioned things like, uh, like um, top and stat, you know, some of the stat tools, et cetera. And a lot of the tools focus on different things. Some of them will show summary data of what your system is doing. Some will show detailed data of what your system is doing. And it's, it's not necessarily that easy, I think, to map from one to the other. Some tools will print timestamps when they report the data. Some tools won't support timestamps. And then there's also... There's also um, technology-specific tools. In the case of um, moving to Linux and working in high-performance computing, there were some very technology-specific tools back then. I don't know if anybody ever heard of Quadrix Interconnect, but this was, the, this was the big honk in Interconnect with like just a couple of microseconds latency and things. And it was very expensive, and that was kind of what bore, that was kind of what bred InfiniBand, which is now the the uh, interconnect technology of choice for high performance computing. Well, there were certain tools that let you monitor um, InfiniBand. There were certain tools that let you monitor Quadrix, and if you wanted to collect that data, you needed yet another tool. And then, of course, in high performance computing, a lot of people were using Lustre as a, as a uh, parallel file system, and it too had tools to monitor it. So the question then becomes, if I'm trying to monitor my cluster, how many windows do I need? Am I running top in one window, you know, IOSTAT in another window, you know, InfiniBand monitoring in another window? And, and then you have to be able to avoid getting eyeball whiplash trying to see what's going on on all the windows and, and, and coordinate them. 
Now, I'm not sure if this is going to show up or not. Um, I, I noticed that some of the earlier presentations, people will put up screenshots and it'd be kind of hard to see them if you're in the back of the room. So I'll be, I'll be real quick on this. But the point is, if you look at SAR, this, this, is the, this is what you see with SAR when you want to look at what your CPU is doing. And that takes up almost the entire screen. And I tried to do the same thing with, with this collector tool down below with like maybe a single line of output. And, and that's kind of the, the whole idea with this is you want to be able to integrate your, your, you want to be able to integrate the data from all the different things that your system is doing in such a way that makes it fairly simple to spot change. Because when you're benchmarking, or like if you're running even top and you're looking at the uh, CPU column, you want to be able to see when that CPU column changes. So another, another difficulty here is that, not, I mentioned already, not all tools log to a log file, which means if you're not watching the data in real time, you're going to lose it. And, and that's a problem. Again, some tools don't time, t don't time stamp their data. Different tools may have different levels of granularity. One tool may show you what your overall CPU performance is, but you're not going to be able to see what the individual CPUs are doing. Um, what else do I want to say? Oh, yeah, of course, if you, if you do collect the data with a particular tool, is there an easy way to pass that data from one tool to another tool for analysis later? And that's not always the case. Centralized tools is an interesting topic that I was just starting to have before I went on. And that, and that has to do with this notion of, again, more in supercomputing if you're, but it applies to other places as well, if you're collecting a high frequency of data and you're sending it to a centralized monitoring tool, can that centralized monitoring tool stick it in a database in real time so that you can look at it and then perform some analysis? But there's another really important issue here as well that we didn't, we didn't get a chance to get into, and that is if you're sending the data over the network and you're having a network issue, the data is never going to get to where it's going, so how are you going to diagnose the network issue? Which again, I see some nods in the back, which is another good reason why I'm a major fan of logging the data locally. You'll, you'll hear a little bit later that Collecto can log the data locally and send it over the wire so you can get both. So if the network were to die, you would still have your local copy. So some of the features, some of the features in Collecto, and I'll try to get through this fairly quickly because I think seeing some examples will help a lot more. It's got this notion of multiple ways of displaying the data. So you can display the data once you know, let's say you're playing it back and you want to look at it in a different way with different green, you know, you can look at it in multiple formats. So one format might give you a high level view of what's going on and then you might want to be able to drill down deeper and look at it differently. It also has the notion of fractional and sub-second monitoring intervals. And I was like, why the hell would you ever want to monitor your data more frequently than once a second? And the answer is, well, if you're seeing something that, if you're seeing a spike that's only there for a tenth of a second, well, maybe you do want to see tenth of a second monitoring or half second monitoring or whatever. Collecto can run as a service just like SAR. You start it up when the system boots and it just keeps running forever. It manages its log files, etc. It's very lightweight. One of the big issues, again, this has its roots in high-performance computing, and I might not have been as careful if I wasn't doing high-performance computing. Collecto uses about a tenth of a percent of a single CPU to collect data. And uh, that's if you're doing it at a 10-second monitoring interval, which is the default. But of late, not being in a high-performance computing environment where we, have more C where we have more cycles to burn, I've been running it at a one-second monitoring interval. You get a hell of a lot more data and it's costing you 1% of a CPU, which is, still, which is still not bad. And it tries really hard to optimize screen real estate. And what I mean by that, if you had seen what I was trying to get across in that earlier SAR slide, the more data I can fit on a single line, and that's the important key, a single line. If I'm looking at CPU, network, disk, InfiniBand, uh, you know, whatever traffic, all on one row, and then all of a sudden, one column changes from two digits to six digits, I immediately see that. Whereas if I'm not writing it all on one row, I'm not going to see that. So it tries real hard to be as efficient as possible. One, one tool 
It's a great tool. I, I stole their, their, the data they display is IOSTAT. But IOSTAT does stuff like show you IOs per second to the hundredth. Why are you showing me IOs to the hundredth? You're wasting three characters. And again, three characters doesn't sound like much, but if every single column in your thing is to three decimal di two decimal digits, you're wasting three, char three characters towards each column. And again, as you'll see in a little bit, by not including that, you have that much more room to show much more information. So, and again, the, the last bullet we don't need to get through, but it, 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 it has the typical kinds of stuff you might expect to see in a monitoring tool from disks to CPUs to networks, et cetera, et cetera. So, actually, I already mentioned a couple words about fractional intervals, but one quick comment, and this was interesting, because when I first built it, I, didn't, I wasn't thinking about really crazy intervals. It turned out, probably about 10 years ago, there was a default setting in one vendor's uh, network driver that was reporting statistics every second. Currently, I think network drivers make statistics available at a much higher frequency, but in the day, it was only once a second. Well, it turns out if you're monitoring your, if you're looking at the counters once a second, and the fact that um, the clocks in Linux don't go by exactly a second, because it's really a binary number of jiffies and things, and they just don't line up to a second. If you were looking at network statistics, what you would see is you might see, and let's just say you were looking at bandwidths of 100, just for the sake of a number, you would see 100, 100, 100, 100, 0, 200, 100, 100, 100, 0, 200. And it was like, what the hell's going on? And it, had, and it all had to do with this granularity. Well, it turns out, by changing the monitoring interval to 0.975 seconds in Collectal, all the columns showed up with the right numbers because that was the frequency that the driver was actually updating the statistics. Again, kind of a silly, trivial thing, but it, it makes a difference. If you're looking at disk drives and you're trying to see what's going on with your cache and your controller, a lot of times the cache and the controller, you might do a write and the first write goes to the cache and then the additional the additional writes start going to the physical hard drive. Well, by monitoring your data at a tenth of a second, you can actually watch the controller cache filling. So you'll see a very, very high I.O. rate, and then after the first second, then it'll drop down to something more reasonable. Um, not worth getting into a lot. This is just kind of showing that the way Collectal is written, it, um, it doesn't care whether the data is coming from slash proc or from a, or from a disk file that you've logged it to. It all, it all gives you the same data, which is really handy. So you can look at it in real time or you can look at it after the fact. A couple of basic switches in Collecto, because it is a command line utility. You can, give it a, you can tell it what subsystems you want to look at. You can tell it the frequency you want to look at it. You can tell it what file you want to write it to. If you want to play it back from a file, you tell it what file you want to play it back from. And then this switch is really kind of nifty, is the uppercase P, which says, I want to generate plot file format. And what it does is it generates some really ugly-looking output that's basically date, time, variable, space, variable, space, variable, space, which is exactly what tools like GNU plot or other kinds of other tools want to see, and it makes it extremely easy to plot the data. So if I jump into this, and can people see that or should I zoom in? Because it, 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 it's, it's kind of tough, and I, I, I don't want people to lose out on this. If, or maybe shape recognition is sufficient, but... What you're looking at here is this is something called brief format. And in brief format, we're looking at the CPUs, the disks, and the network. And you'll notice all I'm, sho and all I'm showing for CPUs is the system and the user load. And I'm showing the context switches and the interrupt. That's it for CPUs. For disks, I'm showing reads and, write, reads and writes and kilobytes. And similar for network. The point is, most of the time, I have found when you're looking at system behavior, you don't care about individual disks, and you don't care about individual CPUs. You're looking at, if there's a spike in my disk usage, whether you're looking at individual disks or all the disks as a single number, you're still going to see the spike. So the point of summary data is, 
I want a high level overview of what my system is doing. If I think my system is lightly loaded and I see my CPU load at 50, geez, I'm probably pretty busy. Similar things for disks, networks, et cetera. On the other hand, sometimes I want more information. So there's this other thing called verbose mode, and now it breaks the CPU, the disk, and the network into separate lines. And by breaking them into separate lines, you can now start seeing more information. Instead of, instead of just seeing the CPU system and user load, now you get to see the system load, the user load, the nice load, the load processing interrupts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that gives you a little bit more detail. Finally, the third format is what I call detail format. And when you're looking at detail format, it's literally dividing things out individually. So now, again, I'm, I apologize if people can't quite see this, but now when I'm looking at CPU load, I'm looking at individual CPUs or individual disks or individual networks. So the whole idea is, at least the way I use Collectal, if I, see there's, if I see there's some unusual system behavior, I can then rerun it and look at the individual CPUs. If I'm looking at recorded data, I literally can play back the exact time slice and see both the CPU summary and then the individual loads on the individual CPUs. And where this gets really important is Nowadays, see, because Collector was written, if somebody had a two-core system, that was, they, were, they were a fat city, you know, they had two cores. Now it's not unusual to have systems with 48 cores or more. And when you have a 48-core system, if your CPU load is 3%, does that mean that your average CPU is running at 3%? Hell no. Um, I've seen systems at 3% load where one CPU was at 100%. So it now begins to get more important to be able to drill into the individual CPUs. So that, that's really something that you should keep in mind. Now there's also some additional formatting options and the top chunk is just showing, you can tell it to include timestamps and you can tell it to include millisecond timestamps. I virtually never look at millisecond timestamps unless I happen to be running at a very fine monitoring interval. And again, in almost all cases, I find that a second, a one second monitoring interval is more than enough. Um, I can't tell if he's in the audience or not, maybe not. Santiago has been working on it. He's recently started looking at this problem where I guess some versions um, of, of uh, I, I don't know whether it was Leap or, tumbleweed or whatever, but some versions, they were running on an ARM processor and the system would boot and like within a couple of seconds it would crash. And we've been talking about using Collectal and enabling it to monitor it like a tenth of a second and try to figure out what the hell's going on before the system crashed. And we're both kind of enthusiastic about trying that out. The bottom, the bottom mess is just simply plot format and it's just this squished together thing that really isn't intended for humans to read. There's a couple of unique things that Collectal does that's kind of cool, I think. If, if you look at this, this is what you get when you look at processes, and it looks very similar to PS or top, because there's not a whole lot to say about processes. Everybody says the same thing about processes. But the thing that's kind of cool over here is Collectal will show you the, um, the disk I.O. associated with each process. Sometimes you care, sometimes you don't, but the columns are there in case you ever want to look at them. The other thing Collector will let you do is look at slab memory. I don't know how many people ever find the need to look at slab memory, but there have been cases where you're looking at the overall system memory and generally, just as a ballpark, but generally you, you, you might have you know, a couple dozen you know, megabytes tied up in slab. Sometimes you look at your slab memory and you see you've got five gigabytes of slab memory. It's like, holy crap. Who's using up all my slab memory? Well, Collectal can tell you in a nice formatted way who, what, which, which, types of, which types of data structures are, are tying up your slab, and it can make it real quick to find the answer. And finally, the bottom chunk, and this is more for, the, uh, for KVM heads, Collectal knows about KVM, and you can tell it 
to show me all my virtual machines, and by virtual machine, it will show you the CPU load, the network load, etc. Excuse me. Something else that's kind of cool in Collectal is that you can look at interrupts at the CPU level. So on the top, what we're actually seeing is um, for each separate CPU, we're seeing how many interrupts per second that CPU is doing. Does it matter? Most of the time it doesn't. But depending on you know, what your particular kind of problem is, it may. Again, the thing to keep in mind with Collectal, Collectal, de depending on how you're using it, oftentimes you just turn it on and ignore it, and it happily collects data for a week and then just keeps throwing off the last, the last day's worth of data. And sometimes, sometimes my machine will run for six months and I'll never look at any of the collectal data. But then if there happens to be a, a particularly odd thing that occurred, you can go back to the collectal data and say, geez, what's my system doing then? And that, and that can be very handy. And the other thing that you can do with, um, with interrupt data is you can actually see the individual interrupts by CPU. So that's what this bottom, that's what this bottom display is showing. You might have 50 different interrupt lines, each interrupting at a different frequency, each on a different CPU, and you can glance at this matrix, and if there's any spikes or whatever in your different CPUs, it'll tell you that. Processes and slabs, there's a lot of data. I mean, if you, could picture, if you could picture running a PS command every 5 or 10 or 20 seconds and writing it to a log file, and then you let it run for a day, and then at the end of the day, it's kind of like, hmm, I wonder which process was using the most CPU, or I wonder which process had the most page faults, or I wonder which process was, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or I had a, I had a system crash at 2.30 in the afternoon yesterday. I wonder which processes were running at 2.30 in the afternoon, and was any one of them thrashing my CPU? Well, what PROC analyzes, it's a switch that you can use with Collectal, and it'll come back, and it'll generate the equivalent, of a, the equivalent of a spreadsheet, where each row is a process, and for each process, it'll tell you the time it started, the time it stopped, the, the aggregate CPU time, the minimum and maximum amount of memory it used, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the kinds of stuff that you see when you normally run a PS command. So again, and I keep saying this, I, I apologize for sounding like a broken record, but it's true. It's um, you don't know what you want until you want it, and then you're still not sure. So this just collects everything. And then later on, depending on how your diagnostic journey takes you, you may decide you're glad that it collected a certain thing. So that's, that's kind of like a real high level of Collectal. Collectal does a whole lot more than I just talked about, but clearly uh, that hopefully gave you a little bit of flavor. So the question is, if Collectal only runs on one machine, I'm sorry, if Collecta only writes to a local log file, what happens if I want to do some cluster monitoring? Because Cl Collecta doesn't really know about clusters. Well, it kind of sort of does, because I said earlier I used to run this on 2,000 node clusters. One of the things it does is every log file that it writes contains the host name. So if you want to take all the logs and put them in one directory somewhere for who knows what, you at least know where the hell they came from. Is it, I don't know if it's SAR or not, but I think it might be SAR. It would write files like 10, 11, 12, and it would just simply be the day of the week. So if you tried to put it on another machine, you, you, you'd have a mess. This next comment is really subtle, but it, it's kind of important in an HPC world. Actually, it works in other worlds as well. Let's say you had something go wrong on your cluster at three seconds after midnight. Well, and let's say you were collecting data every 10 seconds. You might go to one machine and something happened and it might have written its log files at two seconds and 12 seconds and 22 seconds. Another one might, assuming 10 second intervals, another one might have written it at five, 10 and 15. Another one might have written it at seven, 17 and 27. Collectal collects its data at the exact same interval, at the, 
on every system. And I say that with a little bit of a smile because, really? It tries to do it within, within a microsecond based on how good your clocks are. But the reality is the data is pretty damn close. So when there's a cluster event, at least you can see what all the different machines in the cluster were doing at approximately the same time. Doesn't necessarily make it that important, but it's really handy. Some things that I've seen people do with Collectal is instead of writing the data to a local directory, write it to an NFS serve. And then everybody can go to the NFS serve and look at the data in real time. It can also export data to Ganglia and Graphite, and you can let them do stuff with that data. The only problem is, I was saying to someone earlier, if you use, if you use Ganglia, and I don't know if it's true with Graphite or not, but with Ganglia, it uses this thing called RRD tool for, for plotting the data. And if you look at the data it plots, you're gonna find out that it lies. And by lying, I mean, what it will do is it will take your data and quote, normalize and munge it. So if it's putting up, depending on how zoomed in or zoomed out you are of the data, you might have one data point representing an hour. So the data point that it's going to put up that represents that hour is going to be the average over an hour. So you're looking at this plot and you see, oh, my network is over here, no big deal. But if you were to zoom in to 10 minutes, you're, all of a sudden now your network load is up to 50%. And if you zoomed in to one minute, you might see your network load was 90%. So as soon as I found that out, I said, I'm not going to use it for doing any of my, any of my uh, graphing because I demand accuracy. And I didn't, want any, I didn't want to look at any misleading data. The one thing that Collecto does do that's kind of cool that I haven't seen anybody really take advantage of, you can configure it in such a way that it will collect data both locally and send it over a network. Furthermore, you can collect data at one frequency and send it over the network at a second frequency. And finally, you can collect a subset, you can collect data locally and send a subset over the network at a different frequency. So again, let's say you had a thousand node cluster, you wanted to monitor your data every second, and you wanted to send some of it to Ganglia, if, you, if that's your thing, every 30 seconds or every minute. And you don't want to overwhelm your database server that's logging all the data. That will let you do it. You could then use a centralized tool to get a high-level view of what your system is doing. And if you think there's something really suspicious going on, then you can log into the machine directly and look at the data more carefully. So if we change gears for a minute, there's this tool I wrote called CallPlot. And the thing that inspired CallPlot was, as I said before, you can have collect the right data in plot format. And what one of my colleagues and I used to do all the time we would take this data in plot format and then write these little scripts that would build a config file and then you would run GNU plot and point to that config file and up would, plot, up would pop a plot. And you gave it a file name and a column number and you know what kind of lines you want, what colors you want. And it was pretty handy. But every time you ran a new set of graphs, you had to edit or hack up the, the script. And obviously that's dumb, uh, but it worked, so we did it. And ultimately I wound up writing a little web interface that would basically put up a, put up a silly looking window, you would click on a few check boxes, and then you'd hit the go button, and what it would do is it would build that command file for you, run GNU plot for you, and then display the plot. And it works great, it works great, and I've been doing it for a long time. The thing that's also kind of interesting is if you do display the plots, it kind of displays them in what I think of as spreadsheet format. So let's say you want to look at your disk, your network, and your CPU load on 20 systems. You'll actually wind up with uh, six, 60 plots, that's six zero. And the way it will display them is for system one, it'll show CPU, network, and disk. 
for system two, it'll show CPU, network, and disk, and then you can scroll right and left, and you can look at all 60 plots on one window in your web browser. It also has the ability to rearrange them and say, I want three columns, CPU, disk, and network, and stack all the CPU ones, stack all the network ones, and stack all the disk ones. So depending on what kind of data you're looking at and how you want to, if you want to correlate the network traffic across all, all, all 50 nodes or how many ever I said, you can do that quite simply. Um, yeah, so when I wrote call plot, I also kind of built my own little plot definition language because I knew that I knew that I was going to want to do a lot of plots, and there's something like 50 plots defined, and it's fairly simple. If you have other plots, you can define them yourself. Fairly simple. So again, not important if you can read the whole thing, but what it is, this is the call plot main window, and. The, the, real, the real trick here is there's a bunch of checkboxes. And if you want to look at a CP, if you want to look at CPU, you click the checkbox that says CPU. And if you want to look at network, you click the checkbox that says network. There's also, there's also a checkbox that says I want to see everything. And that's usually the first thing I do when I'm trying to diagnose a problem is I'll, on the very, near the top, you can put in the date and time from and through. And I'll often, just look at 24 hours worth of data for a particular date and generate all the plots and see if there's any spikes. So what do the plots look like? Here's an example. And I, again, can people, can people see this stuff back there? Um, I'm hoping it's big enough that through shape recognition you can see what's happening. So this is an example of some benchmarking that I did. And it's kind of amusing because when I look at the file name, the file name goes right up here. When I look at the file name, it's from 2006. I guess I haven't updated the slide in a while. But I was doing some benchmarking. I was doing some benchmarking on a network card, and this this was one of the new this was one of the new 10 gig network cards. So I guess that kind of dates when 10 gig networking first started coming out. And I was what I was trying to do was run run different file sizes over a 10 gig network to see how the 10 gig network behaved. And what you can actually, and, and, and the other thing that's kind of an interesting thing to do when you're doing these kinds of things is you, you, you stall a little bit between tests. And the reason you stall between tests, on the one hand, you wanna kinda of let the system settle down between tests, but on the other hand, if you stall, it puts, it puts gaps between the graphs between the plots, it makes them a lot easier to look at. So what we're looking at over here, and I don't remember what the, uh, I don't remember what the, um, what the values of any of this stuff is. This is obvious, this must be megabytes per second or something. No, I'm sorry, this is CPU load. This is, this is, this is megabytes per second. No, this is interrupts, I apologize. Anyhow, what you can see is between each test, you can see the CPU load starting to increase, but it kind of stopped right here. It never, you know, you increased the load and it never went up. And if we looked at the interrupt load, the interrupt load kind of increased and peaked. And it was kind of telling us that we were kind of limited at this point to how fast these, uh, these NICs could go. And it was only later, it would have been nice if I had it, it was only later that I actually added this uh, network, I'm sorry, this, this interrupt processing to collectal. And if you looked at the interrupts, you could actually see the reason this was happening was all the interrupts were going to a single CPU. And we changed vendors for the, uh, for the NIC that distributed the interrupts across all the CPUs and things, things went much better. So that was what inspired putting the uh, network interface processing in. So here's, oh, this is just simply showing you an example of looking at both the client and the server. That's right, I was sending, in, I was sending traffic over the network. And the thing that's interesting is here's, here's the client and here's the server. And you can see that the client is using a lot more CPU than the server. May, depending on what you're looking at, that may or may not be interesting. But again, this is the advantage of being able to look at multiple servers at the same time. 
shift gears again, there's this other tool that I wrote that works with all this stuff called CallMux, because, and this stands for Collecto Multiplexer. And basically what it amounted to is, yeah, all this is good, but I don't want to log into each machine to see what's going on. That's a real pain in the ass. Can't you do anything centrally? And the answer is, well, maybe sort of, kind of. And what happens with CallMux is you point it to a bunch of servers and you give it a collecto command to run. And it runs that collecto command on each server, sends all the data back to the central point over a network, in, over, over a socket, and then collecto sorts it and displays it along with the name of the machine that it came from, and you can sort it by different columns. So that's kind of a long-winded way of saying, think of top, think of the top command. And, and instead of it running on your one machine, you're now running top on 10 machines. And on the far left-hand column, in addition to showing you the process and the CPU load and all the other good stuff, it also shows you the host name. So now you can actually see the top processes across your entire cluster. The next thing to imagine is, well, what if I don't want to look at processes sorted by CPU? I want to look at processes sorted by memory size. Well, not a problem. You just tell, you just tell call mux sort by this column instead. So it's a, it's a clusterized collectal from that, from that perspective. And um, I'm, I'm going to just kind of skip through some of this stuff because it's probably more detail than you guys need to get into right away. And I don't want anybody to fall asleep. And it's also getting late in the day. And it'll give me a little more time for Q&A and also to go into some of my scenario stuff. So, so basically, the way you kind of sort of get started with CallMux is you, you actually have to give it a collectal command. And you, and you literally need to tell it what columns of data you're interested in. This is, this is actually the real time uh, by, by, actually, I, maybe I shouldn't have skipped the previous slide. <laughs> the previous slide discusses this mode where you can actually tell it, I'm, in, I'm only interested in one or two pieces of data from each machine, so, dis, so display it in one long line. Because again, the idea here is looking for exceptions, not necessarily looking for, um, it, it depends what you're trying to do with call modes. So what, what winds up happening is in, in what I call single line mode, what we're looking at here, what we're looking at here is actually four different clusters. And for the sake of argument, they're called test one through test four. And what we're actually looking at is, um, what are we looking at? We're looking at network traffic. And these four are showing us the network traffic in, and these four are showing the network traffic out. And then finally, these two columns are showing us the total network in and network out across all four machines. The only thing that's of real interest here, really, is when you start it up, you get a bunch of minus ones. And the reason you get the minus ones is it says, I haven't heard back from this machine. And it usually takes a second or two for Collecto to start and process and start sending data back. And then what you're seeing over here is very, very low network traffic in which is typical of an idle machine. You get, you know, a little bit of network data going on. And then if you look on the outbound side, there's almost nothing. But more importantly, there's this one blip right down here for a burst of traffic. And the only point of this format is it makes it real easy to see a big blast or, or, or changes in behavior. And I have some examples. I don't know if it's the next slide. Yeah, here's the next slide. So here's an example of um, doing some luster benchmarking over in Finiban. And it really doesn't matter if you know what luster is or not, but another way to think of it is, just let's, let's just say a clusterized file server like NFS or Ceph or anybody else. So we're gonna run a benchmark, and what we wanna do is we wanna monitor, we wanna monitor the, um, the InfiniBand traffic between machines. 
So we want to look at InfiniBand in and Infini, InfiniBand out. And by the way, this is, not, this is not intended for you to be able to read the details. However, from, from purely a pattern recognition perspective, if, if these are my servers, and I'm assuming you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here, and there's not too much stuff going on here, can I at least get a, yeah, I'm getting some nods, so good. So basically what this is saying, what this is saying is the clients, the clients are writing some data to, um, the clients are writing some data over InfiniBand. So the servers are seeing a whole lot of KB in. And the clients aren't seeing any KB in because all they're doing is writing. Meanwhile, on this side, the servers aren't seeing any KB out because they're reading. However, the network for the clients is doing KB out. So it gives you a chance, and, this, and then the opposite is true when we get, when we get into doing the uh, reads. But the point is, you can very easily visually see the difference across your 20 different machines all on a single line. And personally, I think it's pretty cool. Here's the exact same thing where things aren't so cool. And again, it's not a quiz or an eye test, but if you come back here, I'm hoping that you can see some of the columns are, are, are wider than others. It's kind of erratic. Some of the columns are registering on the order of 11, 12, 1300. Some of the columns are down in the five, six, seven, which is not good. You know, from a benchmarking perspective, you want to see very uniform numbers. If you look at here, these are my 16 clients. One column is zero, which immediately tells me this, this client isn't doing anything. And then there's some other things where you typically want to see the benchmark conclude and all the nodes kind of finish together or close to together. And here you can very easily see that some machines are finishing before other machines. So, you know, what's, what's, what's going on here? And oftentimes it means, okay, I got to roll up my sleeves and dig into the code and Things are not right. It could be a network problem. It could be, it could be an InfiniBand hardware problem. It could be a lot of problems. And this is not going to tell you what the answer is, but it's going to at least let you look inside the behavior and, and, and get a feel for it. This, this other slide, again, this is not a big deal anymore, so I guess I'm showing a little of the history behind all this stuff. I was at a customer site. They were running this machine with a couple thousand computers on it. And they had this display of <clears throat> three five foot wide monitors. And it was like, whoa, that's really cool. It was a, it was a, it was <coughs> excuse me. And I'm there, wow, I bet I could fit a lot of, I bet I could fit a lot of uh, Callmux data on it. So what we did, we set Callmux up. And in this case, I think it was only looking at a couple of hundred machines, but we're looking at the CPU load. On 200, machine, on 200 machines, once a second, in parallel, in real time. And again, like on the earlier slide I showed, it's relatively easy, even if you can't read the slide, to see when machines were, you know, see when the CPUs were busy, when the CPUs weren't busy. And again, this is, if you could look at the data, you would see that when things are busy, it's 100%. You know, that, that's the way HPC machines run. All the CPUs run it, you know, real close to 100%. Um, yeah, this next thing talks about this thing I call multi-line node, which is basically, it's basically, like I said before, when you do top, when you do like a top command. So what you can see, if I can remember how to back this up. So what you actually, so what you can see in multi-line node, let me jump back here real quick. So what we're looking at in multi-line node, here's those same four hosts that I showed you before, and now we're looking at memory utilization. So you can look at, you know, the amount of free memory, the amount of buffers, how much is tied up with cache, and shortly after I joined the cloud group, 
at HP, we had this public cloud with like 2,000 machines on it or something like that, and people were wondering about what they were doing, and I said, well, let me take a look at it with Colmux, and it turns out Colmux doesn't do that well with a couple thousand machines, but it can do pretty well with a couple hundred machines. And I was looking at the memory load on a couple hundred machines, and with Colmux, you can actually use the arrow keys right and left to change the column that you're sorting on in real time, which is kind of a nifty thing to do. So I start just zipping around looking at it, and all of a sudden, I notice that the system buffers were like 40 gigabytes. And on their 40 gigabytes of system buffer, clearly there's not something, you know, and these were like 256 gig machines, so they certainly had the memory. But I mentioned it to somebody, and he said, oh, you know, there was, this, there, was this, there was this bug in the BIOS on some of these controllers that we've been updating, and when we didn't update them, it was chewing up a lot of system buffers. So literally in like 15 seconds, we found three or four servers that had bad BIOS in, in, uh, in one of their controllers. So really, really handy. So what I want to do now, like for the next few minutes, and I'm probably not, I don't know if I'll be able to get through all of these or not, but maybe if I talk fast, I want to I talk about a few examples of real world problems that I've used Collectal in and have actually figured out what's going on. And I, I think I said this probably six times already. There's really no recipe for how you do this. A lot of people say, okay, tell me what I need to do with Collectal to solve my problem. And the answer is collect a lot of data, study the hell out of it, and you know, keep looking and drilling down until you figure out the problem. This stuff is hard. I mean, sometimes you get real lucky and in the first 10 minutes, oh, look at this, here's the problem. But sometimes it you know, can take a really long time. And sometimes you need... Sometimes Collectal's not the answer. I've, I've seen situations where with Collectal, I can get to the point where, yeah, there's some unusual CPU load going on here. I really don't know what it is. It's time to get out. It's time to get out a system profiling tool. If, everybody, if anybody's ever used like profile and you can literally see you know, which functions in the kernel are executing. And, and sometimes you just need to do that. And depending... And again, depending on the problem at hand, we always like to talk about bringing in the subject matter expert. If you have a particular application that's misbehaving, the, only, the best way to get to the bottom of it is have the person sitting next to you looking at the data together, and you say, look what the system is doing. And it's like, whoa. And, and, and sometimes the answers come a lot quicker. And the only, hard, the, only, the only frustrating part is sometimes you go away for a week or two trying to diagnose a problem, and you tell management, oh, all we had to do is change this config setting. And they say, what, and it took you two weeks? And it's like, sometimes it's really hard to find these problems. So this was kind of an interesting situation. We had this, um, we had this Cisco switch, and it was a 10-gig Cisco network, and it was supposed to have a 40 gigabyte per second backplane. And what I did was I ran some network tests between, you know, it had like eight machines connected to it. And what I did was I would run Collectal on all the machines, and I would have like one machine ping another machine, not ping, uh, run, run a, a high bandwidth network test. And it might come back and get you like, you know, like 50 or 60 megabytes per second. Um, 10 gig, I'm sorry. 500 megabytes, wait a minute. No, a couple of hundred megabytes a second or whatever it was because 10 gig is gonna limit you, 10 gig is gonna limit you to about 1,000 uh, megabytes per second on a particular machine. And now we're, we, were getting about, we were getting about 800 megabytes per second. I would start up a second pair of, of, of tests and instead of going up to 1,600 like I would have expected, the one that was running at 800 dropped down to about 400, and the second one started up at about 400. So I was, only, I was still only getting about 800. Then if I fired up a third one, then the other two would drop down, and my aggregate was never getting more than like 800, 850, something like that. So I talked to the local people about, is there something wrong with the switch? And they said, well, no, it should be working, and I showed them the data. So we escalated a call to Cisco. I called somebody, I told them what was going on, and they didn't believe me. 
So I said, can I speak to your manager? So they escalated me again. I spoke, still wouldn't believe me. I escalated up a few more levels because this was a big Cisco company. They finally got a senior person to come on and look around. And it turned out that something was misconfigured on the switch that was sending a mirror of all the traffic out one of the links. And the link that it was sending out was a 10 gig link. So it was limiting the entire switch to 10 gigs. So problem solved. This was kind of an interesting scenario. I've mentioned Lustre a few times, and that's kind of because a lot of the earlier collecta work was done with uh, high-performance computing. But what we're looking at here is a couple of graphs, and these graphs were generated by call plot. And what we're do and, and I did a couple of of I/O tests doing reads and writes. And what happens is the um, the top graph is actually showing the data that Lustre sees, and the bottom graph is the data the network sees, I mean, the, the performance. And what you would expect when you're doing a bunch of writes is the network and the actual data on the other end are the same or very close. And it worked great for sequential operations, but when we did random operations, what we found was the, um, the network load was far higher than the client, than, than, the, uh, than the data load. And, we didn't, and we're staring at it and staring at it, and then it occurred to us that what was happening, we were doing some reads, and Lustre has this property called read ahead. So when you wanted to read a megabyte worth of data, it would read 40 megabytes worth of data. So as a result, we were generating 40 times the network traffic over the data traffic, and that's why things ran so slow. And Collectal made it real easy to visualize that. This was another one of these weird, these weird situations where <clears throat> we had this customer who, um, who had eight cores running, trying to talk to Lustre, and each application was reading a 20 gig file, which is not necessarily that big a deal, but it was killing, it was, not only was it killing the, not only was it killing the performance of the local machine, it was killing the entire cluster. And after a little bit of digging, we found out that the entire bandwidth going out to the Lustre servers was being consumed. We also find out, I also found out by talking to the guy who wrote the application that even though he was only reading 20 gigabytes, he was actually doing it eight times. He was, he was a lousy coder. He was a lousy, a lousy coder. And um, so as a result, these eight cores running on this machine, each core was reading 160 gigabytes of data. So, I mean, it was reading a huge amount of data. And now, again, Lustre's pretty fast, so it was going on the order, you know, of... Um, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred gigabytes a second, but that, but it was consuming everything just trying to read the data. And, and thinking about it for a while, I happen to know that Luster, Luster does do caching. And I knew that these machines had, um, I, I they might have been 64 gigs, something like that. And I said, you know, you're, you're absolutely killing the system if, if instead of running, eight copies of your application on the eight cores, if you run one copy on the eight cores, at the very least, the first 20 gigs should get cached. So when you read it seven more times, it should come out of cache, which is what he did and the problem went away. So here's a little plot showing, you know, uh, cache consumption. <laughs> And the, the challenge is, can you spot the guy? It turns out there was also a bug. There was also a bug that we found that looking at the slab data, which I talked about ages ago, we found when we, re because we saw the slab memory usage was really high. And going into Collectal, I found out the name of the slab that was really high. And it was LL underscore something or another. Well, LL stands for luster light. And if you Googled the name of that slab, the very first hit you got 
was memory leakage caused by lust or light, and here's the name of the slam. And the way you fix it is you unmount the data and remount the data, and that frees up your memory, and everybody's happy again. But again, it's an example of using a combination of Collectal and Google. This was, this was probably one of, uh, one of my finest hours, and maybe, I, actually, this may, be my, this may be my last slide, I'm not sure. We had this... Um, we had this HP customer, and they had a 200-node high-performance system, and they, uh, they were upgrading their hardware. So they bought, you know, 200 shiny new machines from us, and then they plugged it in, and they said, we got a big problem. Every five or ten seconds, we're seeing a drop in our InfiniBand traffic. Now, the thing you have to remember, when you look at a high-performance cluster, which is something... It, it kind of boggles the mind because when you look at a high-performance cluster network uh, system, every CPU is running it at or very close to 100%. It kind of it kind of like violates every law you've ever heard about, you know, system administration, you know, behavior, whatever. Every machine is running at 100% CPU. Every every InfiniBand network is pinned. I mean, these machines are working their butts off. And that's the whole point of HPC. You want to utilize all the resources. So a five or a 10 second drop in Finiman traffic is horrible. And when you take a look at all the machines in parallel, when, when this drop occurred, it occurred on all 100 machines at the same time. And like your immediate thought is, ah, shit, it's a hardware problem. There's something wrong with the InfiniBand network. But if you think about it, this is one of these deals where you need a subject matter expert or at least you need to know enough about the environment. And it turns out in high-performance computing, if folks aren't familiar, there's this thing called MPI, which is the, um, uh, it, it's some kind of, pair, I forgot what the M stands, a multi-processing interface or something like that. And what, what happens with MPI is Picture, picture even a couple of machines, and one of them says, I got a problem to solve. I'm gonna hand it out to, I'm gonna hand it out to like, you know, all you guys, solve the problem, and then when you solve it, give me the answer, and I'll put your results together, and then I'll give you some more work to do, and then come back and give me some more work to do, et cetera. Now, in MPI, this typically happens on the order of thousands of times a second, sometimes even more. Well, what that means is if one machine is a little slower than the others, everybody is going to wait. Because every time I give you the problem, i got to wait a little longer for you to finish. Furthermore, if there's an intermittent problem, and one time this machine is slow, and one time that machine is slow, and one time that, everybody's got to wait. So I was asking myself, is... Is this behavior caused because there's something wrong with the InfiniBand? Or is there some bizarre problem in the system somewhere and that's causing everybody, and that's causing different machines to slow down and the fact that those machines are slowing down is what's causing the InfiniBand to slow down. So I'm sitting there saying, oh boy, I got myself a tough one. And this was like, I've, I was already into like four or five hours looking at data. And, and what you do, the only thing you can really do is just start looking at stuff and seeing if there's any anomalies. So, you know, I, I did my standard call plot thing and I said plot everything. And I noticed something really bizarre. And it wasn't completely obvious immediately. But if I happen to look at page faults, per system, every once in a while, there was a little spike in the page faults. Not much, but there was a little page fault spike. And it kind of sort of looked like when that page fault spiked, the InfiniBand dropped. And no matter where this page fault was, all the InfiniBands dropped. And it's like, oh, man, is this a coincidence or is this real? So I'm there, I wonder if I can tell which process is causing the page faults. Well, if you may remember, I said before 
that when you run, uh, when you run collecto looking at process data, you can actually run it sorted by the column of your choice. And actually, no, I was talking about Colmux doing that. But you can also do that with Collectal running it. There's a, there's a top switch. There's a lot of switches. But the bottom line is I was running Collectal. I was sorting it by page faults. And every so often, this one process showed up at the top of the screen corresponding exactly to when that InfiniBand thing occurred. And it turned out, it turned out it was a puppet client. And I don't know, what the hell's Puppet doing with InfiniBand? And again, our subject matter expert, the customer, he's there, oh shit. And I said, what? And he's there, I thought our machine was identical, but I forgot. When we set up our Puppet client, we were pointing him to a different network and he was going over all these switches and there's probably a delay that's causing Puppet to fault, which in turn is slowing down that machine. So he's there, let me try disabling the Puppet client. So he goes and disables the Puppet client, no InfiniBand drop. So <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. I thought that was pretty cool. So that was, that, I guess that was my last slide. So in any event, if anybody has any questions, I'd certainly be happy to entertain them. And if you guys know Santiago, who again, I don't see here, but that's okay. Um, he, he and I were talking about Collectal, and I may have made a convert, and he's already got it running, and he's going to be starting to use it. So if anybody needs any co local Collectal consulting, then maybe he can help provide it. So I'll be quiet. I'm just thinking how to formulate the question. Um, I'm very interested in, in monitoring. So my question would be, um, can you define some levels for specific CPUs or IO bandwidth issues and then um, have some kind of event that can be triggered if those levels are reached? That's a, that's a, great, that's a great question and the simple answer is no. Um, the reason I say this, the reason I say this, and this is purely, this is purely a philosophical question, from a, from a philosophical perspective, I'm a big fan of doing one or two things and doing them really well. And the more, the more stuff that you stick on, if you start sticking on GUIs, if you start logging to databases, if you start all this other stuff, there's that much more to support. And the more stuff that you have to support, the less attention you might be paying to other things. So the short answer is no, it doesn't do it. However, however, I tried to, to put a lot of capabilities in Collecto that would allow other tools to use it. So for example, one thing that you can do with Collectal is you can tell it, send this output over a socket. And if somebody's on the other end of the socket listening, then they could do it. However, for some people that's a pain in the butt. I don't want to figure out how to do socket pro, I just want to write a bash script, you know, forget all this socket stuff. Collectal has another option where you can tell it when, when the time comes to, and, and you know, you could also say, well, I could always tail the collect the logs. Well, now that's a pain in the butt too. Well, there's another option that says, whenever you take a sample, write it to a file with this name in this directory. And the next time you take a sample, overwrite the file with the same with the same name in the same directory with the new information. And now if you do that, you can write a bash script, and every five seconds, 10 seconds, two hours, whatever you want, you can read the file and you can see what Collecto just did. So that's kind of a backhanded way to say, well, if you want to figure out how to do the eventing, you can, but Collecto can get the data for you and put it where you want it. And, and again, if you, if you actually want to follow up on that, you, know, you could certainly shoot me an email or something. So anything else? I know it's kind of tough being the last act of the show. 
Uh, I was wondering what the packaging status of it is. Is it in Tumbleweed and is it in Leap uh, already? And what's the situation with that? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm still trying to get my brain straight around how, how all this release stuff works. However, and I, 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 yes, I see someone coming here to help me out. But I know that, I know that Collectal is currently in Leap and Tumbleweed and as... Yeah, um, it's it's everywhere in OpenSUSE, as far as I know. Uh, it's also in Leap. Uh, it's definitely in Factory in Tumbleweed. Uh, and uh, I've just opened a feature request to also get it in SLES. The one other thing that was kind of an accident, but I got lucky when I when I when I picked the name Collectal. As far as I know, I don't think there's I don't think that word exists in any language because if you Google it, you immediately find it. Whereas some of these other things, you Google them and you find out things you don't want to know. <laughs> so if, if if that's it, thanks for coming and uh, have a couple beers for me and. Uh, I guess that's it.